a shake and a shiver, glints and gleams and sparkles, rustle and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. As he sat down on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye, and dreamily he fell to considering what a nice, snug dwelling place it would make. As he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star. Then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye and a small face began gradually to grow up round it, like a frame round a picture. A little brown face with whiskers, small, neat ears, and thick, silky hair. It was the water rat. There's a crispness in the air. The morning mist still rises from the river bank. With patience and, like Mole, a keen eye, just the place to find the real Mr. Ratty. And the first thing to be said about him is that Kenneth Graham got it wrong. This charming creature, one of the central characters from The Wind in the Willows, as delightful in true life as he is in the book, is not a rat at all. Graham was, in fact, writing about the adventures of the water vole. Water voles are widespread in Britain, but they're such timid animals that few people ever see them. In the water, he's as much at home as on land, and it's this naturally amphibious lifestyle that sets the water vole apart from its close relatives, the bank and field voles. A water vole seldom strays more than three or four meters from the river, and like all rodents, he's a natural burrower. The banks they colonize are riddled with holes, and it's easy to see how this energetic little earth mover got its old country name, Water Mole. Every vole constructs its own elaborate subway system, complete with nest chamber and emergency exits which can be used as escape routes. Usually, they're drilled into the river banks. Each burrow will have at least three entrances, one underwater. And the water vole has devised a remarkable technique for covering his tracks from prying eyes. As he enters the hole, he stirs up a muddy smoke screen with his forepaws. The perfect vanishing trick. Any animal which spends half its life in the water must make sure its fur is in good condition. And the water vole is fastidiously clean, using tongue, teeth and paws to keep its coat well-groomed and waterproof. Water voles are among the oldest established mammals in Britain. They've been with us since the Ice Age and are the largest of our native voles. Overall length, about nine inches from nose to tail. Once you've learned to recognize the water vole, you will never again confuse it with one of its greatest enemies, the brown rat.
Rats are sharp-faced and scaly-tailed, destructive scavengers who will eat almost anything. The water vole is altogether different. From his round, furry face, more like a dormouse, to his smooth, hairy tail, he's a harmless vegetarian and no match for the more aggressive rat, who will often take over water voles' burrows and drive them out. Like water voles, rats can swim. But unlike the vole, they would rather jump and stay dry. Tethered by its own timidity, the water vole feeds close to home, using paws like a squirrel to eat any vegetation it can safely reach. Everything within easy nibbling distance of the feeding hole is soon consumed. The resulting patch of close-cropped grass is known as a water vole lawn. Other signs of water vole activity are the runs which funnel through the bankside undergrowth. Water voles are extremely short-sighted and these well-trodden waterside paths help to keep them on the right tracks. These runs are marked with a personal scent gland which announces individual territory within a community to any intruder. Even underwater, they tend to follow the same familiar channels between the weeds. In early spring, the search starts for a suitable mate. The male spends an increasing amount of time nosing around his territory. This serves to warn off competing males as well as increasing his chances of mating with more than one female in the river community. This log is not just a convenient water vole latrine. It also serves as a boundary marker, a frontier post dividing the range of one territorial male from the next. And the water vole droppings advertise that he's in residence. Male callers unwelcome. Like the dab chick, whose world he shares, the water vole is an expert diver. If alarmed, he will plunge in with a splash to alert other voles, but usually he submerges quietly with little more than a gentle plop. Water voles can remain submerged for up to 30 seconds. They're lithe and graceful swimmers, and although their feet are not webbed, they kick out strongly, their quicksilver flanks agleam with air bubbles. Underwater, they're almost blind and desperately vulnerable to lurking predators. Many a water vole has ended in the belly of a pike. This chance encounter is perhaps the only time Kenneth Graham's animal characters will meet in the wild. But the real world of the water vole is every bit as fascinating. And with the courtship rituals of the coots in full swing, the voles too are ready for mating. Courtship and mating is a brief and casual affair and may be consummated either on land 
or in the water. Spring is now well advanced. Already the coots have begun to build their nesting platforms and the water voles must prepare their own nesting chambers. The babies will be born about four weeks after mating. To receive them, a chamber is hollowed out in the bank, filled with an untidy ball of reeds, sedges and fibrous roots, and sometimes lined with the soft, pithy core of rushes. This is typical vole territory slow waters where life bobs gently, untroubled by swift currents or the sudden spates of upland becks. And in May, when the water crowfoot is in flower, there's nowhere lovelier than these languid southern streams. At this time of the year, it's an idyllic life down among the king cups. The riverside growth is at its most luxuriant and the voles make the most of it. This one is feeding on ground elder. Water voles have prodigious appetites. They thrive on a healthily vegetarian diet of leaves, stems, roots and corns. Lily stalks are a favourite delicacy, but there is one food it likes even better. A water vole will sell its soul for a bite of sweet apple. If there's one thing guaranteed to tempt a vole into the open, it's the sight, or rather the smell, of an apple. See if you can get it underneath that tree over there. As if to demonstrate his poor eyesight, the vole paddles right past the apple first time, but eventually locates it with his keen sense of smell. It's going up right around that hedge there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going up into that hole. There's another one, look. A second vole is lured by the smell, but its myopic eyes fail to notice the first animal until the last moment. Everywhere on the river, new life is emerging. The mallard with her ducklings. The mute swans and their young. While these cygnets may live for 30 years, the life expectancy of a baby water vole is one brief summer. A few veterans may live for 18 months, 
But five and a half months is the average span for a newborn vole. But autumn is a long way off. Now, naked, blind and helpless, they are intent only on being suckled. For the newborn voles in their riverside nursery, a sudden storm can spell disaster. A rise in the water level of just a few inches can become a matter of life and death for the babes in the burrow. But if the flood does come, the female will try to move her family to a safer chamber, higher up, out of harm's way. Outside, the rain is still lashing down and the river is swollen. But the voles are safe from the flood. She licks and grooms her two-inch long offspring one by one before covering the nest to keep them warm. It's hard work swimming when the stream is in spate, but voles must feed. At this time of the year, nothing is stored. They eat only fresh food. With nostrils constantly unraveling the riverside smells for hints of danger, the female feeds hurriedly. She must eat as much grass as she can to convert into milk for her babies. There are five young in an average litter, but in some families there can be as many as seven hungry mouths to feed. Soon, the storm is past. The returning sunshine brings out the basking demoiselles. The river becomes its old, placid self again. Now the young are seven days old and covered with fine red hair. Their eyes won't be fully open for another three days, but they're growing fast. The female suckles them four times a day, and in just over a week, they'll be emerging for the first time into the dangerous world outside.
Death waits for the young voles in many guises, but none so deadly as the barn owl. Its soft plumage muffles all sound of its coming. This spangled assassin's hood hides the sharpest ears. Nothing, not even the twitch of a water bowl's whisker, escapes these all-seeing eyes. A sad end for one luckless youngster. Yet without owls and stoats and other predators to keep them in check, the voles would overrun the river. It's nature's way of balancing the books. At four weeks old, the young voles are self-sufficient and able to fend for themselves. In the play of youngsters is a hint of the aggression they will soon use to drive out their parents and take over their territory. The fur of the young voles is changing colour. Now they are taking on the mantle of adult voles and are more aware of danger. One quick stab with this yellow dagger and another vole's life could be cut short. Herons are a constant peril, but this young vole is safe inside his burrow. The heron has gone, and so has the summer. There's a smell of autumn in the air, frost and dying leaves. For the parent voles, it means that their brief lives are drawing to a close. In the world of the real Mr. Ratty, winter is the ultimate predator, and he will soon be here. A gleaming carpet of fairy was springing up everywhere that looked too delicate to be trodden upon by rough feet. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out. Then the mole heard him saying quietly to himself, Hello, hello, here is a go. What's up, Ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly. Or rather, down. It's been snowing hard 